Hey church family, Pastor Nate here. I'm in my office and uh, I wanted to open up God's word with you and uh, share a couple of things that have been on my heart. I'm going to do a series of videos that will come out over the course of this coming week and uh, the following. Uh, one of the things that uh, Pastor Grant and I have, we've been chatting and, and wanting to encourage you and teach you, and he's been encouraging you by reading through the Psalms uh, with his kids and inviting you into his home. And uh, I want to invite you into my office and uh, and do a little bit of teaching. One of the things that I'm seeing right now is uh, Christians are trying to navigate and think through um, everything that's going on right now is uh, the question has come up as to are Christians commanded to gather and how important is the physical gathering of God's church? Um, there have been plenty of people who have said things like, you know, as long as we're meeting virtually, if we can still hear the word, if we're together in spirit and all that kind of stuff. And I, I don't disagree that uh, we ought to use technology as I am right now in a way that glorifies God. And we are so blessed to be able to live at a time when we can utilize technology like this. That's amazing. And uh, all technology ought to be used and uh, uh, to glorify God and put under the feet of Jesus and victory. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the importance of gathering. Why do we gather? Why, when we physically come together, is that important? And we're going to get into Hebrews 10, 25, and we're going to get into the ecclesia, the gathering of God's people, and how God's spirit is uniquely present when we gather together. But there's one thing I do want to uh, share that's kind of first and foremost on my mind. Uh, one of the reasons we gather is to celebrate the Lord's Supper. As you know, uh, the night before he was betrayed, Jesus uh, had a physical meal around a physical table with his physical disciples, sharing a meal, breaking bread together, drinking wine together, fellowshipping with one another, looking at each other face to face. And, uh, and when he instituted this Last Supper, when he instituted what, uh, what we now call the Lord's Table or communion, he was instituting something that the early church latched onto as a regular act of our worship. It's one of the sacraments, observing communion in the Lord's table together. And I don't want to get into, um, you know, all the nitty gritty of, of what that means, but I, I want to just very, very kind of surface level, um, very, very uh, easy to understand. I want you to go in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is one of the places that the Apostle Paul gives instruction for us to practice communion regularly. You'll notice, interestingly, and I won't get into all this, but uh, for your own study and for your own thought, um, Paul starts by rebuking the Corinthian church because they're practicing the Lord's table when there is disunity among them. And the disunity among them isn't the sort of just disagreements on things. Unity goes far deeper than that. Unity is, is something that we cultivate a, a level of oneness, a level of one mission, one body um, in the midst of diversity of opinions and, and stations and thoughts. And uh, the disunity that he's talking about here was the factions that were created based on socioeconomic um, uh, stations in life and, and who would eat with whom when they were observing meals together. Um, but in verse 23, he, he goes on to the positive commands and he says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and while he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way as he took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me so he's he's giving us the command as often as you gather right do this do this and so this is why we practice weekly communion this is why it's always a part of our our sunday gatherings um but uh but he ends that um paragraph by saying in verse 26 for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if we're considering this passage in, in under the theme of why do we gather? We gather because we are to observe the Lord's table 
as a proclamation of the death of the Lord until he returns, until he comes. Who is that proclamation to? And I want you to think about this. In the church setting, I mean, certainly we have an obligation to proclaim the Lord's death, right? To proclaim the gospel to one another when we gather. Absolutely. Um, and we do that. But who is the primary recipient of this proclamation? Who are we proclaiming this to? Well, what happened when the Lord died? When the Lord died, he bought back this world, right? Satan stood in front of him in the, uh, in the wilderness and said, if you bow before me, I will give you all the nations of the earth. And Jesus didn't rebuke Satan by saying, um, they're not yours to give. He, he rebuked him because he, first of all, the scriptures say, you, you know, don't worship no one uh, other than God. And he rebukes him with the scriptures. Um, but Satan was tempting Christ with a way of gaining the world, gaining the nations while circumventing the cross. He was giving him an opportunity to do it in another way. And um, so when Jesus uh, went to the cross, he accomplished what Satan was ready to hand him if, if Jesus would simply lay down his convictions, lay down his obedience, and fall to his knees and worship Satan, then he would have circumvented the cross, but he would have got what he came for, the world, the nations. So when Jesus died on the cross, he bound up the strong man, right? When he, when he, uh, when he died on the cross, he crushed the head of the serpent as the, the, the bottom of the cross was driven into the place of the skull, the hill of the skull. Um, the rescuer was crushing the head of the snake. Jesus dies and he wins the world. What we are proclaiming as we come to the Lord's table is his victory over the powers and the principalities of darkness that held this world in bondage. Think about what it says in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 6, it says in verse 12, For we do not wrestle against f flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, <clears throat> against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You know, when we talk about um, persecution, when we talk about the church being locked down right now, um, when I say things like it's persecution or, you know, um, things like that, I often get the pushback saying, I don't think that this is persecution. Like compare this to the persecution Christians have endured throughout the ages. I would say my answer to that would be two things. Number one, yes, but how did that start? Secondly, I would say this, I don't believe that Doug Ford or Andrew Fossey or um, Fauci or, uh, or Prime Minister Trudeau or any of these people, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that they have malicious intent and they are single-handedly trying to single out the church for persecution and shut us down. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that the spiritual forces of evil that are in the heavenly places, that are in the high places, the, 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 the principalities and rulers of darkness have an agenda. And one of their agendas is to make sure that the proclamation of Christ's victory over them is not proclaimed weekly, is not proclaimed around the earth. The, this word proclaim, when it says you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, is the same is the same word that Peter talks about in his epistle when he says um, that Christ descended and proclaimed victory, proclaimed victory to the, um, the angels that were in chains. So, so Christ's proclamation of his victory on the cross over hell, over the principalities of darkness, is the same proclamation that we make when we observe communion together. So why do we gather? We gather in order to proclaim to the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly places, all of those principalities that are pulling the strings, that have an agenda and are steering our government to make de um, decisions that would stop the proclamation. We are proclaiming to them, Christ has won. You have been defeated. He won the nations. He's winning this world. Christ has been victorious. That's what we claim. And that's why we gather. One of the reasons we gather is that we can come around the Lord's Supper and proclaim that message to the powers of principalities that are invisible to us, 
but are shaken to their core when we proclaim that victory. That's one. That's the first video of uh, hopefully what will be a series. Hope you're helped by that. Um, as always, I'm here for you. Reach out to me with any questions uh, that you have during this time. We love you. We're praying for you. And, uh, and I hope this is helpful. Take care.